Hey everyone, welcome back. So this is going to be the next video in our NLP series. And today we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic called part of speech tagging. So part of speech, interestingly enough, is something you probably learned all the way back in elementary school, probably the beginning of elementary school. So let me give you a quick refresher just in case you forgot. And then we'll talk about why we might want to do this, why it's important to do. And then we'll talk about one of the very popular methods to do that and talk about some consequences going forward. But starting from the basics. What is part of speech tagging? So we have three sample sentences here. For example, the first one says, I like his watch. Now in English and most other languages too, each word is belonging to a general category called a part of speech. For example, some easy ones are nouns and verbs. Nouns being people, places, or things. That's what we first learn in elementary school. Verbs being action words, things that describe an action you take. So for example, in this very short sentence, we have four words. The first one is a pronoun, for example, I, he, she, it, so on. The next one is a verb, like, because that's an action, you are actively liking something. The next one's also a pronoun, his, to refer to somebody else. And the last one is watch. And in this context, it's a noun, because you're saying, oh, I like your, like, wrist watch. But that'll be important as we get to this third sentence. But the second sentence here says, the man fans the flame. And so as we understand it, we're picturing some man and he's like fanning a flame so the flame gets bigger or continues burning. And so we have a determiner. So the, a, these kind of words are called determiners. The man is a noun. The fans is a verb because that's an action that he's doing to the flame. The is a determiner and flame here is a noun. So now I wrote this third sentence because it includes several words from the previous two, but they're used in very different ways. And now we start getting an idea about why we might care about part of speech tagging in natural language processing. So this sentence says, the fans watch the race. So we're imagining now some kind of stadium full of fans and they're watching some kind of uh, race, either a car race or people racing something. Uh, but the words used here are the same exact words used up here, but in different contexts, different parts of speech. So for example, the is a determiner. Here, fans is a noun because we're talking about spectators or humans who are watching something rather than the action of fanning something. Watch here is a verb. Although before we were talking about watch as in wristwatch, here we're talking about the action of actively watching something. Here this is a determiner and race here is a noun. I didn't use the word race before, but race can also be a verb. For example, I race you in this uh, competition. Versus here we're talking about the physical like, race that's going on. So we see now there's a lot of ambiguous situations. Sometimes it's even hard for humans to discern whether this is a verb or a noun in the context it's used. And so we want to make sure that the computer is understanding the meaning of sentence or paragraph correctly. And part of that is going to be understanding what part of speech everything is. So here's some applications of why we care. This could be a very important feature in text modeling. Just for example, pretend you're analyzing uh, precedential speeches. Each precedent has a very different style of speaking, a different style of giving speeches. Some might use a lot of adjectives, maybe some use a lot of nouns. So we wanna make sure to understand like what's the proportion of adjectives you use or what's the number of nouns you use. That can be important in understanding the style of some kind of writing. We might also wanna use it for something interesting called autocomplete. So when you're going in Google and you type something like, I want to, how does it figure out what's the next word? Part of that is gonna be part of speech tagging because we know that I want to, uh, and then the word pizza probably wouldn't come after that because pizza is a noun and we're probably looking for a verb of some kind. So that's going to be important. And also word ambiguity resolution, as we talked about here. We want to be able to take a word like watch and figure out if we're talking about it as a noun or as a verb and so on. So this is what it is and why we care. Now let's talk about the two biggest classes of methods to deal with this. The first one, we won't go too deep into this one, but I want to introduce it, is rule-based. So you can think of rule-based part of speech tagging as basically a huge uh, set of if-then statements that are trying to capture all of English language rules. So for example, you could say like, oh, if it's a noun, then the next thing would have to be this. Or if you see a noun, then maybe after this we'll have this. So basically what it's trying to do, this might be written by um, an expert, for example, a linguistics expert, and we're trying to basically capture all possible combinations. Now, this, the pro of this, of course, is that we're directly taking into account the language. We are not basing, uh, we're not basing it on probability, we're not basing it on statistics, it's based on linguistics. But the con, of course, is that there's just so many cases we're going to have to consider that we're not going to be able to get all of them, and so we're going to have to default back to this second case anyway.
But there is definitely pros to this method, especially if you have a very uh, rigid set of rules for what part of speech things can be in the particular text you're looking at. But the way that we go about it more, and we have a lot of tools for this, is stochastic or probability based. And specifically using this old tool that we learned a little while ago called the hidden Markov model. So I will say here that it's best if you come into this video having watched the hidden Markov model, which I'll link below. You don't absolutely have to watch it, but I think that it's better because you'll see that what I'm about to talk about is just a application of the hidden Markov model. It's not something completely new. So natural language processing just uses the hidden Markov model, which is used in other fields as well. So it'll be easier for you to understand. But the hidden Markov model treats this sentence as a very interesting structure. So again, if we go back to the hidden Markov model, the premise is that we observe some states. So for example, we look at a sentence such as the fans watch the race, and we observe that. We can see that on the piece of paper in front of us. Now, the hidden Markov model, as the name hidden suggests, also says that there are some hidden states, some unobserved states, which generated the observed states that we did see. And this particular implementation of the hidden Markov model says the hidden states are exactly the parts of speech. So putting it all together and kind of telling the story from the beginning, this application of the hidden Markov model for part of speech tagging says there are some hidden parts of speech, some underlying parts of speech. For example, in this case, it's determiner, noun, verb, determiner, noun. That's, of course, hidden to us. But those states generate the states that we do see, the observed states. And that's what these vertical arrows are representing. Now, the Markov part comes in because it says that the hidden states have transitions from one to the next. For example, if this one's a determiner, there's a certain probability that the next one's a noun. Then given this one's a noun, there's a certain probability the next one's a verb, and so on. So the two processes going on, the two distinct parts of this process, rather, are the transitions, or the transition probabilities from one hidden state to the next, and the, as they're called, emission probabilities which say, given that something's a noun, what's the probability that it's the word fans? Given something's a verb, what's the probability that it's the word watch? And so if we have these emission probabilities and we have these transition probabilities and we have the final sentence, then we're in good shape. We can go ahead and run the hidden Markov model, which as we saw in that video, amounts to maximizing a probability. Specifically, we're trying to find the parts of speech. So PI going from P1 to PN where N is the number of words in your sentence. These are all the parts of speech which are again hidden to us. So we're going to try every single one, every single setting of these parts of speech. And our goal is to maximize this quantity, which is the probability of jointly observing those parts of speech, whichever ones we've chosen, and the observed states. So W1 through WN are the literal words that we see on the page. And so this probability, although it might look a little bit crazy, is answering the very simple question of what's the probability of seeing this sentence and some setting of hidden states? And we are going to pick those hidden states such that that probability is maximized because that's actually what we do observe in the real world. So we say that if we found the hidden states which maximize this probability, that's the most likely settings for the parts of speech, and so we go with those. So it's an easy enough concept to understand once you've sat and kind of thought about it for a while, but let's think about the biggest issue here. And we won't talk about how to resolve that in this video, that'll be the topic of the next video. But let's say, just moderately, that there's five different choices for parts of speech. There's actually many more choices for parts of speech in real life, but let's just say there's five. And let's say that you have ten words in your sentence. That's a moderate length sentence, there's definitely sentences that are much longer, even. Now, how many different possibilities do you have to try for this probability? So how many different uh, choices do you have to maximize over? Well, each of these P's has five options, five different parts of speech, and there's 10 of them total. So there's going to be five to the power of 10 different options for you to maximize over. And if you work that out, that's almost 10 million, which is not practical, even for a small sentence of length 10 and a small number of parts of speech that's just five. So we need some kind of more efficient algorithm than just doing a brute force search over all of these possibilities in order for us to do this part of speech tagging in any reasonable amount of time. And that's where we get this really cool method called the Viterbi algorithm, which is again going to be a topic of the next video. I'll walk you through actually this exact example, the fans watch the race, and I'll walk you through some real life uh, app working through of the Viterbi algorithm, and you'll see how you can calculate this much more efficiently than this brute force search. But the main thing I wanted you to get across in this video 
is that this is what parts of speech are, just a refresher. This is why we care about them, and this is one of the most popular methods for us to do this part of speech tagging. Maybe the last thing I'll say is that this is not the last method. Like, you can get even more complex than this. Notice that we didn't take into account, like, the two words before. The Markov model only takes into account the last word. But if we want to build an even more powerful model, maybe we take into account two words before, three words before, or the entire history of words before. So we can actually build on this model. But this is the general basis of part of speech tagging in natural language processing. So uh, hopefully you learned something in this video. Please like and subscribe if you did, and I will see you next time.